Um, before we start, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal and Nambri people. And I wanna pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging as well. If anyone is joining us online who is not in Ngunnawal country, I'd like to also extend that acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the lands that you are joining us on today. I'd like to acknowledge that the sovereignty of this land was never ceded and always will, or always was rather, and always will be Aboriginal land. And um, I'm gonna pass over to Joe now who will take us through. Oh yeah, you'll do the Yeah, perfect. Can I just, oh, how is that working? Click maybe? Okay, um, so before we introduce the first speaker, um, we just wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge some awards that have um, been given to people in SMP. Um, so Ben Stewart received the Best Student Poster Award um, at the recent Experimental Psychology Conference. Uh, his poster was on uh, meta-analysis of face and visual context interactions in emotion perception. So congratulations to Ben. Um, and the second award that we want to acknowledge is actually was given to one of our presenters uh, today. So Carly Johnston over there um, recently received the VCs award for teaching excellence. So I believe this was an award for 2022, but was uh, you recently had that um, ceremony. So congratulations, Carly. Okay, and please do let us know if any of your students maybe publish their first paper or any awards or anything you want us to acknowledge. We're really happy to do that through the seminar series. Um, I'm going to pass on, I'll just stop sharing now. Okay, so um, I want to introduce our first speaker now. Um, so our first speaker is Mila Nezovic, um, who, feel free to come and join me up here. Um, so Mila's presentation today is titled What is a Student Identity? Um, and just a little bit about Mila first. Um, she's a third year PhD candidate in uh, SMP um, under the supervision of uh, Lillian Smythe, Michael Plato, uh, Ale Alexandra Webb, and Christina Voltakowski. Uh, she completed her Bachelor of Psychology uh, with honours at the ANU in 2019, and her research focuses on the application of social psychology to higher education, with a focus on promoting socialisation among students to better their learning. Please welcome Mila. Thank you. Okay, so as an introduction to just my research overall, for those who don't know me, I focus specifically on the examination of students' approaches to learning. So essentially how students choose to study for particular tasks, keeping in mind, I guess, their wider learning context and also their experiences of how that learning approach has turned out in the past. So I do all of this through the lens of social identity theory, and I'll be talking through the way that student social identities are commonly discussed in education psychology literatures today. Okay. Okay. We figured that one out. So today we'll start with the basics of what social identities are, as well as how they can be linked to study behavior in university students before looking at how student social identities are discussed in the literature and assumptions regarding their relevance and salience. So here I've got existence, which really captures both of those um, about their formation and also about their meaning. So once I've done this, we'll consider what being more specific about identity can do for us. And I'll outline some preliminary plans for upcoming research. So you'll see on the screen there, I've also got Lisa written and I've come up with, I guess, a fictitious character that I'll be using to, I guess, better explain my points as I go through the presentation. Um, and I'll revisit Lisa after a little while. Um, I'll revisit Lisa after a little while to really, I guess, strengthen my points as I go through. So I think I need to use the mouse to actually get this to go. Okay, so if we start with social identity theory, what we're essentially saying is that people derive part of their self-concept from social identities. And these are defined as an individual's knowledge that they belong to certain social groups together with the emotion and value significance that these memberships hold. So something that I'll be drawing on particularly heavy throughout this presentation is the second half of this definition, which hints at the importance of the content of identities in that it's not only being a member of a group that informs the content of identity, 
oh sorry it's not only being a member of a group that informs someone's social identity and by extension how they define themselves but also its perceived meaning so tied to these identities are expectations for how people in that particular social category or group should behave um, or the types of values that they should hold and we refer to these as norms it's through normative influence that a person's group membership can influence their behavior and values and have real world consequences or benefits so to summarize all of this if one of the groups that you belong to easily comes to mind and you consider it important to how you see yourself is likely to form one of your meaningful social identities. And because of this, you're more likely to behave in ways that you consider normal for members of that group in comparison to another group which you don't identify with. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I have this character, Lisa, and she studies psychology at ANU. But even just from this description, we can see that there are a range of different groups that Lisa might, I guess, identify with. So she might think of herself as an ANU student, university student, undergraduate, first year psychology, or even more specifically as being on a clinical or research psychologist pathway. So the main point I'm making here is that how Lisa defines herself depends on the salience. So how easy each of these groups, I guess, comes to mind when she thinks of herself, as well as the importance of these groups for Lisa. So in the context of university, we can see that there are already multiple social identities, sorry, multiple social influences for the normative behavior of students and this includes their studying behavior. If Lisa perceives the norms of study in psychology to be very studious, she might feel pressured to act in accordance with this. But if she sees all of her classmates, I guess, skipping class, being behind on lectures, she might be a bit more relaxed in how she approaches her own learning. So one of the things you might've no noticed is that I'm focusing really specifically on study related identities. So those we might derive from our time at university or any other educational institution. So the student identity is really one of the most prominently examined social identity in the education psychology literature for, I guess, obvious reasons. It's a pretty good crossover between the two fields. And we can see that um, the importance is really well illustrated in these two quotes here. So possibly one of the most relevant social identities is based on the group membership university student. And then you can see the authors have also gotten more specific here. So they've mentioned psychology and architecture groups within that. And we can also see that Whilst going to university is a complex experience, besides cognitive challenges and it places strong demands on social and personal development, these authors have argued that the development of a student's social identity is important for a successful transition through university. So despite, I guess, the focus of both of these papers being quite different, they're both really saying how important a student's social identity is. And this level of, I guess, analysis has allowed us to conclude that higher identification with study-related identities, so I guess a whole range of different study-related identities have been captured here. And this has been associated with deeper learning approaches and better grades, intentions to continue studies, as well as belonging, and I guess a whole range of other benefits that I haven't listed here. Whereas difficulty, I guess, having this identification has been associated with surface learning, so I guess a bit more cramming and rote memorization procrastination and self-handicapping. And this is in the case where the way that a person is defining themselves is at odds with a student identity. And we can also see that difficulty identifying has been associated with lower academic achievement. So whilst we can make all of these conclusions using that level of analysis, it's really not without issues. So I'm gonna go through, I guess, a couple more quotes um, from an author named Johnson and their colleagues but I've just summarized the main points up on screen. So participants are often asked how much they think and learn about group memberships and how committed they feel to them rather than the specific content or meaning of the group memberships themselves. They also know that research about identity development has focused primarily on research, researcher chosen domains or it's been overlooked entirely. So what they're really saying here is that researchers often choose the student identity as I guess a level of analysis without stopping to question their participants about what this means for them. So in many cases, we make assumptions regarding the relevance and salience content and meaning of a student's social identity. And thankfully this issue has started to see the light of day. So if I break up, I guess what I've just said here into three key assumptions, we can start to see, I guess, a lot of the issues and on the next slide, I'll go through some open questions as well, which comes out of, I guess, just assuming that a student identity is relevant and that that's where we can stop. 
So as I've mentioned, possibly one of the most relevant social identities based on university student. And this really ties to an assumption about the relevance of identity, but also within this top category, I've mentioned the salience of identity. So again, referring to how easily a group membership comes to mind. So students don't usually have much time to reflect on concepts like self-identity until the end of a milestone, such as the end of medical school. And as you can see here, the authors are assuming that their students don't think about the fact that they're a medical student all the way until the end of medical school. Regarding the formation of identity, we see a quote that we've already mentioned as well. So entering university, for instance, is likely to induce the formation of a student's social identity. And we've also got a similar quote here in that identity formation, which is social and relational in nature, occurs for future physicians in their first year of medical school. So in both of these cases, the authors are arguing and assuming that students don't have a student social identity or study related identity until they're already, I guess, attending university. And then finally, the content of identity is actually a lot harder to capture a quote for because it's often just simply not described in the literature. But a couple of examples that come close are that university students identify themselves and are identified by others as members of the social community within the university. So here we see assumption that feeling like you're part of a social community is important to university students. And we can also see a quote saying that medical student social identities are shaped by experiences throughout training as they learn to perform physician duties. And here we see that physician duties and the capability of being able to perform these form part of the medical student social identity. Whereas in this case, the researchers didn't actually stop to check that this was the case. So, in terms of the questions that are raised by leaving these three assumptions left open, so in terms of the relevance and salience of identity, we're not really sure if a student identity exists in all the cases that we're trying to research it outside of when we're explicitly asking participants to imagine one. And we're also not sure when it's actually relevant. So do students think this way about themselves when they're not at university? And also again, when we're not questioning them explicitly using this language. We also have questions about the formation of identity. So are university student identities actually being formed during university by people attending university? And also who's contributing to this formation of identity? So is it the case that it's only people within the university context that are, I guess, informing the content of the identity and what it means to the participants that they're questioning. And then finally, the content of identity. So how do students actually think of their study related identities if they exist? Do they mean the same thing as what researchers think they do? And is there any meaningful or impactful variation, even just on the individual level, um, despite how slight this might be? And does this impact, I guess, their learning approaches in a more applied context? So we often fail to acknowledge even these assumptions as well as the existence of other social identities that might be salient and impactful on students' learning behaviours during the, the time that they're actually attending university, but also in the lead up to this. And I can further illustrate this with the um, example of Lisa again. So Lisa doesn't live her whole life at university. While she might attend psychology at the ANU, she used to go to private school. She's the first in her family to attend university, works as a waitress and plays soccer in her spare time. So if we consider what each of these group membership mean for Lisa's perceived norms for behavior, we can see that there are actually a lot of different avenues for influence. And this is the argument that I'm making. Even when we look at a relatively simple example, there are already so many people that could influence what Lisa believes attending university should or could involve. Perhaps she has a sense of grit and determination from playing soccer. Perhaps her family has ideas about what higher education involves and what the outcomes of this will be. And perhaps her private school education gave her an idea of what it meant to be a university student before Lisa even applied for university. So even if Lisa does actually identify as a university student, as is worded in a lot of cases, what this means to her might be different to what it means for one of her peers. And it might be the case that even slight differences make a big difference in how Lisa learns and also the outcomes of her learning. So, Research on study related identity content and formation is quite thin at the moment. However, more researchers are starting to recognize the importance of this in their own work. And I mentioned Johnson and colleagues a little bit earlier, but I want to go through their work here a bit more, as well as that of Vanderwall. So, 
In terms of Johnson and colleagues, they were interested in the salient identity content of US adolescents. So they wanted to know how these adolescents wanted to describe themselves when asked. And whilst they were guided a bit more by Erickson's developmental theory, I think the ideas apply really well in this context as well. What they got their participants to do was to answer the prompt, I am, 10 times. So for example, they might write, I am a psychology student. And they were assuming that responses that these adolescents were given were really relevant to their identity content. What's more concerning is that despite these participants completing this task during school time, they only mentioned being a student 96 times out of over 4,000 responses. And of course, this brings up a lot of issues when we're, I guess, assuming that a student identity is relevant and meaningful for students, even if it's, I guess, in a university context rather than a high school one and an Australian one instead of, I guess, an American one. Somewhat similarly, van der Waal were interested in the gender differences in identity content of emerging adults. So in this case, they're looking at psychology undergraduate students. And they did a similar task and then they got their participants to verbally describe themselves over three minutes. They found something similar in that education related descriptors were much less common than them recreational and personal descriptors. So in Johnson and colleagues, um, paper, they have a really good criticism of their work and that it's a contextual. So whilst they collected 10 responses from the participants, they didn't go a little bit further in asking their participants to actually explain what those responses meant or how they fit together. And this criticism can also be applied to the work of van der Waal. Despite the collection of verbal responses from participants that arguably had, I guess, more words in them. So this criticism of the limited research on the content of study related identities leaves us with holes for an iterative study that allows us not only to collect responses from participants but also to question their meaning. Um, and this brings me to my own work. So at this point you might be thinking why is she talking so much about the literature and quoting people so much and that's because I'm talking about a study that is sitting with the ethics committee. So unfortunately I won't be going through my results today but I'm going to guide you through I guess my plans with all of this background in mind. Um, so with that said, I'm planning a qualitative study in which I investigate the formation and content of university related identities. And also I want to know more about the people who influence students approaches to study and I guess their wider learning behaviors at university. So as you can probably tell from the slide, this study will have three stages. The first involves refinement of survey questions with a small group of approximately six undergraduate students. The second, a distribution of a qualitative survey to 30 undergraduate students. And the third will involve interviewing five, hopefully closer to five, to 15 of these participants that completed the qualitative survey. And this is so I can get some more depth um, out of their responses. It's worth noting that I. Ideally, I'd like all of my participants to be from the ANU, just so that I can control for some of that, I guess, contextual information that I'll be collecting. So I'm anticipating that I might need to expand my pool to include participants from just Australian universities in general, but hopefully just ANU. Um, so if we revisit these three assumptions yet again, the kind of indicative questions that I'm thinking of asking my participants are for them to describe themselves at university and potentially also outside of university. And this really relates to, I guess, how they're choosing um, all these different descriptors and how they could be linked together, much like the other qualitative work that I've gone through. I also want to know in what circumstances or context that they might think differently about themselves. So even in the studies that have thought about identity content, content before, they haven't necessarily considered whether this changes when students are going through exam period, when they've gotten good results or bad results. Regarding the formation of identity, I want to know what they thought university would be like before they commence their studies. And I also want to know what it was actually like for them so that we have an idea of whether, I guess, this identity that they might have now, whether that was created before university started and whether it's changed or not. Then finally, regarding the content of identity. So this topic is quite broad. More specific to my study, I wanna look at who makes up the group us at university. So who do students consider themselves 
at least somewhat similar to. And I also want to know who students might observe and who they might ask when they're not sure how to study or behave at university. And this is a bit of a different way to get at the normative influences that might be acting on students. So it might be the case that students are really asking, for example, an older sibling who's already been through university how to study rather than one of their peers in the classroom. So in terms of, I guess, the qualitative process, and just in case someone's, I guess, not so familiar with it, I'm just gonna give you a tiny bit more information about the focus group and the interviews now. So in the focus group stage, what I'll do is really focus on refining the wording and the response options that I give participants. So I want to know if participants will give me the type of responses I expect, and if not, how I might change my questions to get this information. So if I ask students, so if I plan to ask students who they observe when they're unsure of how to study, as well as who they might ask, but my focus group could tell me that they don't have an answer or that they would give me the same response to both questions. I really wanna get this information before I guess I send out a qualitative survey and try to get more of an in-depth response. I would also like to trial a few forced choice questions instead of providing a free response to questions like those which refer to circumstances in which participants think differently about themselves. So in this case, I don't wanna give my participants a label that I've preconceived as was already a problem in the literature. I want them to tell me what's important to them. And I also don't wanna give them responses that they don't feel are relevant in any case. So whilst I could give them options like during exams, teaching periods, university break, I might be missing something and I might give them responses that they don't choose if given the opportunity to respond freely. And then finally, regarding the interviews. So as I mentioned, the focus group informs qualitative survey which informs the interview protocol. One example question I could ask here is really what is it that makes a person someone that you seek advice from and like I've mentioned before I really want to get depth out of these responses um, so that I can really tie together all my data at the end of the day. So at the moment um, I'll wrap up because I don't have results to go through at the moment. Um, but by addressing our assumptions that certain university student identities are relevant and salient, what their content is and when they are formed, we can create a clearer picture of how to better support students learning at university. And we can also gain a better understanding of which covariates to account for when we research university students learning so that we can design better informed studies. As I mentioned, I'm waiting for the ethics committee at the moment, so I can't comment on the exact questions that I'll be asking participants or at which stage of the study I'd be doing that. However, I'm more than happy to take questions, suggestions, and tips for qualitative research um, if you have those. And I want to thank you all for attending my talk. Oh, thank you. Um, so do we have any questions for Milau? Yeah, just open the chat as well. I think that the identity of a student can be quite different, but we see the same here where we have some five sexual violations. Yeah. How are you going to talk about this? Um. Well, the best thing I can probably do is ask about it um, and have it be one of the discussion points that I have, because I guess my sample sizes won't be incredibly big for this kind of research. It's definitely something that I want to capture when I describe my sample. And hopefully um, we can get some really great information out of something like that as a contextual factor that's not always considered in the research. Yeah. Um, probably still on the university experience aspect, um, just so that everything fits together still. But of course, like if that's forming part of, I guess, the responses, it's something that I'm going to have as, I guess, a theme in my research. If that answers your question, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, they didn't hear it. The mic wasn't working. So... 
Um, but some people did. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, there was a follow up question online um, from Panema. Why is this going to not be affected significantly by the pandemic, which occurred during the formation of their identity? Maybe that was someone asking a similar question along the Yeah. Same, I think it would be age. affected significantly, but it might not be the case that everybody thinks that way. So if you're, I guess, thinking about a university student identity for the first time during COVID, it might not be the case that you think it's any different from any other student identity. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Paul Joe Joe, I'm a professor of public health in the medical school, part of the um, School of Medicine and Psychology. Um, in medicine, we do experiments and studies on the patients. Maybe. In psychology, they're commonly done on students, which is no doubt something that you've reflected on a fair bit, but it's unusual to do a study on students about being students. Is there any anything that you've drawn from all the other psychology studies of students that is um, you know you you thought about or that's affecting your design or your study? Um, I think. Just repeat the question. Oh, can I repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question from Paul was around um, the fact that the study is a a study about students on students <laughs> and wondering if there's any. Uh, existing literature that Mila could draw on to. So, what was the last part of that question, Paul? Uh, just most, psych a, a lot of psychology studies are on students. Mm. So is yours. How are you drawing on that? Ex their experience from the other studies for your study. Okay, so more about yeah, just generally how you're drawing on the previous literature. Okay, so as a bit of a cop out answer, I'd say that this entire study is based on, I guess, my knowledge of psychology, recruiting participants that are students all the time. So hopefully that makes sense. So the entire purpose of the study is really just a reflection on gaps that I've seen. Um, so not only, I guess, when I was a psych student at ANU and having to go to, um, I guess, research participation and take part in other PhD students' research to get course credits, but also considering the fact that a lot of the time I was kind of boiled down to being, I guess, a number. Um, so even in like all the social research that I've been reading and, you know, everything's making an argument that context matters, for example, to then look closer at that and see that there's almost no capture of contextual information that's at least somewhat consistent. Um, that's really, I guess, given me motivation. Um, to do something like this, even though I'm sure it's going to take me a very long time to get through. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Maybe wrap up. Maybe one more question. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank well, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next um, speaker is Carly Johnston. Um, so Carly's uh, talk today is going to be on exploring burnout during COVID-19, results from a PhD. Um, Carly's a pharmacology lecturer who teaches pharmacology and prescribing to medical students. She's a pharmacist by background and worked as a specialist clinical pharmacist in critical care for more than 15 years before starting um, at ANU. And upon her arrival at ANU in 2018, she commenced both her teaching and her research careers, starting a PhD uh, at the same time as uh, teaching at the school. Uh, Carly has just recently completed her PhD, congratulations, Carly, uh, in burnout in Australian pharmacists during COVID-19. Please welcome Carly. Thank Hi, hello everyone. Um, so yes, my name's Carly. I am almost exactly the opposite of Mila where all I have is results to share. So that's a bit annoying for you. You're just going to hear everything I've already finished. Um, I had I have just identified so strongly with everything you were saying then because I'm in this situation now where I don't know who I am anymore now that I've just finished my PhD. Like what is my life now? 
Um, and this sort of process of identity formation for me over the last four or five years has been really difficult because I identify as a pharmacist, I identify as an educator, I identify as a student researcher, and now I don't know what that really means as an adult researcher, if that's even a thing. Um, so I'm just listening to you go, oh my gosh, there's so many things here that I'm now reminding myself I've got to work through. Um, so I, yeah, I've uh, just finished uh, my PhD. I got told not even a month ago that it's done. You're finished. You're finished. Um, isn't it funny? Cause I had no idea what that whole process really felt like. I didn't know what a PhD really was. Um, I did a PhD because I got burnout as a clinician. I worked in ICU. Um, I'm not crying. I've got a, a watery eye, but I might cry later cause it's really, this is all very personal. So you'll hear about it. Um, and I had burnout uh, as a pharmacist in ICU twice, left the final time left, uh, left completely. Um, and when I talked to my colleagues about my experience, it turned out that it wasn't just my experience. There were a lot of people who had a really similar experience to me. And so I thought, oh golly, there's something here. Um, and then one of my supervisors, uh, Imogen Mitchell, she's an ICU consultant who I'd worked with for years and she said uh, and I said I'd be really nice to find out more about this and she said don't waste your time doing something properly if you're not going to get a PhD out of it so do it properly do a PhD get it done and so that's how this all started I took six months off in 2018 uh, to recover from burnout spend some time with my kids um, and then came and worked part-time at the university to review the pharmacology curriculum told them they need a pharmacology lecturer went for that job got it boom, um, and decided to do my PhD at the same time. And then, you know, the first little bit of your PhD where you don't do anything, you know, that first year where you're like, what is this job I've now got? What's that doing? I did that for about a year, kind of worked out what I wanted to do, not really sure, did lots of reading, uh, and then COVID came. And so I had this lovely plan. I presented my oral, <clears throat> you know, um, TPR, thesis proposal review, presented that on the... 18th of March 2020 and Imogen my supervisor was the COVID response person for the hospital at the time and she went this is not going to work because I wanted to talk to pharmacists about burnout and she said all anyone's going to want to talk to you about is COVID and so it turned into a COVID PhD. Thank goodness because everything got done really quickly so the ethics committee were like oh you're interested in COVID tick tick off you go see you later um, everybody wanted to talk to me about COVID. It was wonderful. It was the perfect time to do this kind of thing. Um, you can see I also started homeschooling my children and teaching on Zoom all at the same time. So that was really fun and lots happening. Um, and I went back to ICU three days a week to train pharmacists um, in critical care because there was going to be this big surge. So I want to tell you a little bit about pharmacists because people who aren't pharmacists don't really know what pharmacists do although I tell you what aren't they in the news this week but don't want to talk about that um that's really not something I can focus on today uh but essentially there's two kind of main types of pharmacists particularly in Australia it's community pharmacists you know the ones that work in the chemist that you go and see with your prescription and then there's hospital pharmacists like myself who work mostly in hospitals on the ward in the interdisciplinary team so I don't really work independently I'm kind of with the ICU team talking about medications and um patient safety and whatever else. Community pharmacies in Australia are individually owned and operated and therefore profits from community pharmacy go into the pharmacist's pocket, okay? That's really important because the way that that works and the stresses are very, very different in community compared to hospital um, settings. That's pharmacists. That's just a quick little story about what they do. The other thing that you need to know about uh, as part of my research is why is burnout important? Why do I want to look at it? A couple of reasons, personal reasons. One, I have told people I have burnout. I say, yeah, I had burnout. I still, I've studied it now for quite a few years as well. Still can't tell you exactly what it is. The, the What is it and what it means to people, I think is really, really different. Uh, but it costs the Australian government about $700 million a year in lost income, in attrition, in turnover, in... Uh, people not really wanting to do what they're supposed to be doing at work. So poor um, output. 
And we know from previous data that the impact, particularly when we talk about healthcare professionals, the impact is really threefold. So the individual who has burnout does not do well. There's a higher rate of uh, depression, anxiety, reduced job satisfaction, alcohol and substance abuse. So, you know, negative coping strategies. The patient suffers. So we know that there are increased clinical errors. Patients report lower um, satisfaction with healthcare, increased mortality, prolonged hospitalization. So this is for patients who have clinicians that have burnout, this is their experience, much, much more negative compared to those who have clinicians who are not burnout. And from an organizational perspective is reduced productivity, intention to leave, reduced teamwork and therefore efficiency and effectively, and reduced working hours. So people work less, more sick calls, et cetera. So it's a big deal. Um, that's why I think it's important to look at, right? So that's me justifying my research to you so far, hopefully. All right, so here's what I set out to do. So I set out to understand burnout in Australian pharmacists during COVID and really to explore how the pandemic was affecting them. There are three main papers that came out of my PhD and, and a you know one of the early ones, you know, like a review, that kind of, that first one. Um, but there's three kind of data papers that came out of this. The first one is a quantitative study that looks at the results of a big survey that I released to Australian pharmacists. And it really measures burnout scores, determines what factors are related to their um, experience and both work-related and psychosocial. The second paper is also quantitative and it looks at, pulls out the data to say, are there specific profiles of pharmacists who are more at risk? And then the third paper is qualitative where I've analyzed what people told me in a free text comment section. I'll walk you through each of these. Um, to kind of understand a little bit more about what they really felt. So <clears throat> burnout is complicated, unfortunately. It's defined by the World Health Organization as an occupational phenomenon that results from unmitigated and sustained workplace stress. So it's a workplace problem, okay? It's not saying that your personal life doesn't play in, but it's saying it's predominantly occupational. It is really defined by three different categories that fit into it. I'll tell you more about them, but they're emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and professional accomplishment. There are lots of different th theoretical models that have been used to describe it or at least attempt to, to describe what um, burnout is. The one that I've used when I've done my qualitative analysis is something called the job demands model, which basically, if you've got too many demands and not enough resources, you get burnout. Um, lots of different tools, heaps of different tools available to actually measure, as in quantitatively measure burnout. I've chosen one called the Maslach Burnout Inventory. The reason why I chose it, one, it's expensive, so it must be good. Just joking. It was a real nightmare because it's expensive. Um, but it is the one that is most commonly used in the literature. So I've used it because I can kind of draw some comparisons probably if I use it. But they've all got their pros and cons. Um, and basically, we know from... A, reviews pre-COVID, there are some things that really matter in terms of pharmacist-specific burnout. And that is if you're young, if you work more hours per week, if you consider your workload high and demanding, or if you haven't got enough colleagues, not enough staffing resources. There's only one previous pharmacist burnout study in Australia in 2007 done in hospital pharmacists um, by a cool guy who I know who's great. All right. So in terms of the sort of effect of COVID, in January, we found out there were, in 2020, we found out there was COVID, right? It was probably December really, but January is really where we started to hear more about it. And we got our first case in Australia. If you remember back then, we had just come out of a terrible, worst bushfire season in Australian history. There was a lot of um, and the reason why this is important because the demand on community pharmacy at that time was really significant. So people had lost all their medicines, lost their houses. Community pharmacists were doing all of this amazing work, but they were really tired before COVID even came. So we had this kind of process. And I really, one thing I think we didn't really do is grieve in that time. We just kind of went back on and went through COVID. And so I think the fact that the bushfires were there is a really important. In March, we closed non-essential businesses and stopped um, travel. There were significant changes to healthcare delivery. So telehealth, GPs went home and saw their patients via telehealth. Medication management was really strained. Heaps of medication shortages because of 
we couldn't get things across the borders. We couldn't get things from overseas. Lots of patients were freaking out and stockpiling all their medicines, need six months of my blood pressure medicines in case I can never go out of my house again. Um, we started using old medicines for COVID treatment. So particularly things for say rheumatoid arthritis, there were a lot of medications where people who had chronic conditions who needed these medicines could no longer access them because we were using them to treat patients with COVID without a lot of data, but that's neither here nor there. And there was an increased use in Australia of critical care medicines. So certainly in ICU, there are certain medicines that we cannot do without. And we were starting to look down the barrel of not having them anymore. So we had to go through this process of what else could we use? How else would that be managed? Meds that people weren't familiar with, writing protocols around that. So it was all this sort of movement in terms of medications all at one time. Sounds stressful, doesn't it? Um, so I, um, at the beginning, I put together a paper uh, really early on, got published sort of early 2020, which was really nice again, because it's COVID related. Everyone was really interested in it. Um, we had no burnout data at that stage, but basically what I did was had a look at all of the things that um, other places around the world had told us that pharmacists were struggling with. So what were going to be the pressure points for pharmacy in Australia based on anecdotal reports from overseas, but also what are, what are things that have happened in previous pandemics that we can maybe learn from and implement now before things get too crazy. So that's what this paper really did. We had a couple of things that we knew from other, um, from other papers that would probably be important. So a sense of fear and uncertainty, particularly around passing COVID on to family and friends. So if you're working in the front line as a healthcare professional, when you get home, what's the risk to my family? Really big concern. Um, rapidly changing recommendations. So one day you have to have sneeze guards up in your pharmacy, the next day you don't. Like it's this constant, you have to wear a mask, you have to wear gloves, you don't have to wear any of those. So this is constant moving of recommendations, supply shortages, just an increase in general workload, which I'll talk to you about in a sec. Um, but we weren't ready. We were not ready or prepared and we hadn't recovered from the bushfires and that was going to be a really big problem. So we said what people probably need is practical skills to deal with stress, flexible support. So support that people can access when they need it and in a way that they need to access it. Clear communication. So stop changing recommendations every 15 minutes. Give us some clear guidance. There wasn't a lot of that. Infection control awareness and also sort of awareness around epidemiology. So pharmacists in community were having to give advice around risk, um, but also that acceptance of personal risk, um, knowing that working in that sort of job was probably going to put you in an increased um, position of risk. So we uh, put together a survey pretty quickly, I'll say, um, used the Mash Like Burnout Inventory, the tool I told you before, so we could measure burnout scores, pulled some demographic stuff and some questions around psychosocial and work-related effects that we kind of adapted um, from studies from other pandemics on healthcare professionals and what, what were sort of the main factors. Um, it was an online survey and I was so lucky because I had a heap of support from professional organisations. So I had a lot of the pharmacy professional organisations, but there's a couple of, um, I don't want to say magazines because it makes it sound a bit nothing, doesn't it? But there's these professional magazines that pharmacists get that everybody reads. Um, so AJP's one. And so I rang them and they said, yeah, let's do a quick interview. Tell us about your burnout and we'll put your survey link at the bottom. And so I had this amazing support from this sort of snowballing um, data collection. Really good. Put it on social media um, and went out. This is too busy to read. Don't worry about it. This is just telling you what's in the survey. But basically it was open for two months um, and we had 54 questions. So how disgusting is that? Can you imagine opening a server that has 54 questions? So I was really, really excited. Um, I won't tell you about that because we got, I will tell you about that, but I just won't stop on that slide. Um, I don't even tell, oh yes I do. So we got 647 full data sets, 1200 responses. So I was like looking at these numbers go up each night in bed, just going, oh my God, look at all these numbers. This is amazing. And in the end, we got 647 participant results, which is big numbers for burnout data and particularly for pharmacist data. And so the first paper really was a really quick release of this data so that there was something out there, right? So really quick descriptive analysis, nothing fancy, really, really quick. And what we basically found 
we compared our males and our females uh, just so that we had something to kind of talk about, I guess, because there was just sort of data dump, really. Make it sound terrible, don't I? Like it wasn't important. It was really important to set the scene. Um, but basically we measured the burnout scores and um, uh, and talked about sort of some of the main factors. And we got, so mostly female, which is really uh, that's normal in pharmacy. It's about a 70, 30 split female to male pharmacists in Australia. Average age was about 40. Most of our participants had more than 10 years experience. Uh, pretty even split between hospital and community, which was really nice because I did know that there would be a difference between the two. Um, I thought there would be, I didn't know. I assumed because I know that they're very different. A uh, lot of um, pharmacists in management positions. Interestingly, the split, isn't it funny? There's 75% of pharmacists are female. And yet there's a higher proportion of males in management positions. That's just my little, you know, just go girls, but not really. Um, and different kind of full-time, part-time. Um, yes. And here's what we found. So only 17% or just over 18% of pharmacists had said they'd actually cared for a COVID positive patient. Now that's super important because the burnout numbers are pretty impressive. So here's people that have, don't even know that they've necessarily cared for someone with a COVID positive result. Most people felt like they had adequate precautionary measures in their workplace, right? Enough PPE, essentially. The main thing that people found were affecting their work was medicine supply. Now we knew this because this is we spent a lot of time doing that anyway, but this was a big thing. Increased workload and incivility and rudeness. So people were having experiences where consumers were coming into pharmacies and being extremely rude and nasty. Not everyone, of course not, but that was a really big factor of what was bothering them about it. 52% mostly of our community cohort had worked overtime and most people were more concerned about the health of their families than their own health. Yeah, so yeah, I know I'm at risk of getting COVID if I'm out in the community. I don't really, that's okay, but I'm not okay. I'm really worried about what that means for my family. Um, now, here's the tricky thing. When you talk about measuring burnout, the Majlac burnout inventory doesn't let you give up, doesn't let you get a prevalence, all right? It says you can't combine all of this and say someone's got burnout or they don't. How annoying is that? Because isn't that a much easier message to sell? What they say is here's the numbers and that's what this means. So what this is saying here is essentially the average or the mean um, emotional exhaustion score is 28.5. Now over here in the corner, also pretty difficult for you to kind of see, I guess, but what I've done is there was a big systematic review just before I did this study um, from all over the world, uh, sort of a meta-analysis, and they've put these cutoffs in. So they've said, if you're above 27, if your emotional exhaustion scores above 27, you probably have burnout. So I've put that in just to sort of contextualize the numbers a little bit for you. So our data has said, okay, uh, most of ours as a mean, they're above the line. For depersonalization, which is basically where you're feeling disconnected from what you're doing, um, our numbers are below the line. So the, they wouldn't technically be burnout based on this other thing, but they're higher than what we're in the systematic review. And personal accomplishment is whether you feel like you're still doing meaningful work for you, if that makes sense. Now in health professions, that number doesn't change heaps because there's an intrinsic sort of comfort around being a helper. Um, so that doesn't change a lot. Um, the, the other thing that we noticed was that there's a specific, there's a statistical significant in depersonalization. So more males experience burnout as a disconnection as opposed to being emotionally exhausted with more females um, identify with. And so we've kind of in the paper, we've sort of said this might be sort of explained or the way that we can kind of contextualize this is through gender role theory where it's sort of more socially acceptable for women to express emotional uh, needs, whereas males it's less uh, less more likely that they'll internalize those um, those feelings. So the next uh, paper is another qu um, quantitative paper where I went, okay, here are all the things that people told us were important, but are there certain pharmacists that I can tell might be more at risk than others? All right, so I did this through cluster analysis, um, which was really fun and something I hadn't done before and I really liked. I'm not gonna teach you about cluster analysis, but it's cool. It's super great. 
And the reason why I really like it, two reasons. One, it's not just maths because gross, boring. I'm studying burnout. Of course, I think that's boring um, because it uses the experience of the researcher to really interpret what's going on and work out whether does this sort of pass the pub test? Does this really make sense in terms of the clinical context of what I'm talking about? Different ways you can do it, but really, really cool. And this is a complicated way to show you what comes out of SPSS. Also boring, right? But let me just tell you what that said. So basically this cluster analysis said you, Carly, in your data have two big clusters. You know what they are? Hospital pharmacists and community pharmacists. Uh, so that was kind of nice because I was like, oh, that validates my <laughs> preconceived concerns. Uh, and the main difference between them is that community pharmacists had higher rates of burnout. So higher, and this is the community numbers over here, higher emotional exhaustion scores and higher depersonalization scores, statistically significantly so. Um, they had more patient incivility. Of course they did because they were in the front line and people were coming into the chemist and they had a higher workload, which again, of course they did because actually in a lot of the hospital work, we had less patients presenting to hospital because they were worried about coming. So actually some of our pharmacists were like, got any work, babe? What can we do for you? Let me help you. So it was great for them. Um, so there's this sort of massive difference, this big dichotomy between the two. So essentially... What this basically what this showed us was that hospital pharmacists, there's some protection there for them because they work in this bigger system. And what community pharmacists have is this real vulnerability to what's happening in community that hospitals are kind of protected from. Um, and so what we've sort of said, some modifiable factors that might really help are provision of PPE. So one of the problems was for community pharmacists, they didn't have consistent access to PPE. So they didn't have consistent access to masks and um, gloves and whatever else. And they had to buy them themselves. They weren't supplied by the government, whereas hospital pharmacists were just in the hospital system and they had access to PPE like all of the other healthcare professionals. Um, and the other thing was pharmacists started doing a lot of jobs that were not pharmacist jobs. So they started delivering medicines. They started standing at the door to stop people coming in. They started, um, can't even think of anything else, but lots of things, trust me, just trust me. Um, lots of things that really changed their work. And so if they could have in some employed somebody that could do deliveries or somebody that could stand at the door, then that would have really helped because they wouldn't have had to do that. Oh, the other thing that really happened was all this, um, GPs were now sending faxes of prescriptions or um, you were getting a text from telehealth and all of these sorts of things. So pharmacists were kind of managing that sort of different workload. Um, so the final step for me, I also interviewed 20 pharmacists or 21 pharmacists um, and I couldn't do anything with that data. I was extremely emotionally blocked with that. It was really hard for me to go through that. It wasn't included in my PhD. Still haven't done anything with it. I promise I will. It's a promise. I'm saying it out loud to you here that I will do something with it. Um, but it was really, really tough for me to listen to those interviews back because they're very, very emotional. So I haven't really done anything with them. But in a way to sort of explore pharmacist experience, we had one free text question at the very end of the survey after 54 questions. You could also write me a story. And you know how many people did? Like a lot, like half of them. Amazing. Can you even believe it? So this is a qualitative analysis of that, of that text, essentially. Here's my whiteboard and my whole wall of my hallway at home with my thematic analysis, um, post-it notes and whatever else. Um, so 33%, so sorry, of um, pharmacists told me some extra thing. I looked at these through the lens of the jobs demand resources model, which I told you before, basically was looking at if your resources are really high, doesn't, you can cope with demands, but if your resources aren't there and you've got high demands, you're probably going to get burnout. And here's what they told us. Yes, we have high demands and we have very low resources. So there's increased work. I'm providing education support to my patients now. I'm doing jobs that GPs were otherwise doing. So I'm taking blood pressures, blood glucose, all these things that the GPs weren't doing in terms of point of care. I'm managing medication supply and I'm dealing with poor consumer behavior. And you know what I really need that I'm not getting? I'm not feeling valued or appreciated. I'm not trained or prepared to be in this position. I'm worried about my own personal safety. My management team don't care about me. They're out the back trying to manage all of this and I'm out the front trying to do all of the actual work. There's no clear communication. It's really complicated. And I need some time off. 
and I'm not getting any. And because when I go home, my friends and family are ringing, asking me what I'll do about COVID. These are all a heap of quotes that kind of just tell you that that's what's there. But there are some really, um, really powerful words in here. It made me really understand just how, you know, this, I feel the profession is deeply disrespected. Um, incivility is a major issue. It's led me feeling extremely emotionally vulnerable and affected my mental health on a daily basis. Like pretty gross, pretty awful stuff. Um, and the thank you messages from the government, et cetera, never seem to explicitly state pharmacists. This is reinforced. We are the forgotten profession. So, you know, healthcare professionals were offered free coffee and all sorts of things like that. Pharmacists were often excluded from that. So they would go up and line up and they'd say, you're not a frontline healthcare worker. So there's just this kind of really overt um, kind of difference. Um, so there is an opportunity here to increase resources because demands are probably not overly modifiable. Demands will be high in pandemics and different situations. But what we can do is really provide resources so that those demands can be coped with. So the recommendations out of this paper were that there were legal and financial frameworks to support pharmacists working in a full scope of practice so they could do that really well, They were, that they be, have education and training and particularly around emergency preparedness and rostering and peer support. So now what? Uh, you don't want to hear about limitations. None. It was perfect. Um, so now what? Um, I have already started implementing a restorative support program in the hospital pharmacy departments in Canberra and in some community pharmacies as a small pilot. I'm going to, to out to tell community pharmacy about it on the weekend. Um, advocating for pharmacist needs. So a lot of this work has really helped um, advocate sort of what do pharmacists need in terms of resourcing next time or moving forward? Um, there is still a really big responsibility for me to share the stories of lived experiences in the interviews that I've done that I've done nothing with that I promise I will. And I'm releasing another survey in two days time to review what's happened now. So three years later, uh, what, is, what does this look like? How has this changed? Whew. It was a rush at the end, sorry about that. <laughs> 